Hello, I'm Kate Story, and I'm going to read you a short excerpt from uh, my book, Urchin, that came out with Running the Goat Books and Broadsides. Um, it's a little ways into the book, and uh, at this point, the main character, Dor, has, uh, has uh, filched some boys' clothing and is uh, up on Signal Hill with uh, Marconi, uh, who, who has come somewhat mysteriously to Newfoundland. Uh, and uh, Dora's there as Jack, basically acting as a spy for Dora's friend, Murph. Murph is a reporter with the Evening Telegram, and Murph thinks something is up. But the other thing that's happened at this point uh, is that Dora's mother has disappeared. Dora's father fears uh, that she, she's, she's dead, that she went astray, fell off a cliff. Uh, she's a midwife uh, and disappeared during a night call. But Dora's convinced that the, the little strangers or the, the wee people, the wee folk, have, have, uh, have their mother. Uh, and the other thing to mention here is Dora has a, a, a friend who's a talking crow named Oberon. I was swiftly revising my estimation of the day. It was, I decided, windy enough indeed. Paget stood on the leeward side, holding a great kite to the ground while myself and the three hired men held a longer line. Marconi would bark out an order, Paget would release the kite, and then we'd pull. The idea was that a 600 foot long wire attached to one end of the kite was supposed to stay grounded touching zinc plates. Another wire attached to the kite connected with a different wire leading through a hole in the window of the old fever hospital. And the kite itself, with all that aerial wire attached, was supposed to sail up to a height and stay there, acting as a receiver. All this in the tumultuous winds of Signal Hill. We hadn't achieved it for more than a split minute, not even once. And we'd been at it for two hours. Our arms ached, my hands, even through the gloves that Kemp had given out, hurt from all the grasping at the recalcitrant cord. As for Marconi, he was practically incandescent with irritation. What kind of fool would come to Newfoundland in December to fly a giant kite? One of the men grunted. I had to agree. Reducing shipwrecks was a laudable goal, but why now? Marconi could have come in the summer to test ship to shore. He could have kept experimenting back in Britain. No, to have decided to come here now. Surely Murph was right. It had to be a grasp for something bigger. All the time I was aware of Oberon, on top of Cabot Tower, or circling around us in the air. The scattered glitter darted around the edges of my vision. I couldn't look straight at them. They danced on the extremities, flickering like sunlight on leaves. A memory of my dream, so long ago it seemed now, when I saw the man on the storm-tossed ship came to me. Those flickering beings of light. It had been Marconi I'd seen in that dream. It must have been. They hadn't wanted him to come. And in the dream, they'd sensed me, too recognized me, fastened on to me. The thought struck me with a bolt of fear like I was a lightning rod. They needed me, but were they friendly, uncaring, or did they want to destroy me? It seemed to me now that Marconi was surrounded by a crowd of them, darting, jabbering, enraged. Tiny sparkling figures crystallized on the kite, thick on the cord, swarming the aerial wire. Only with my peripheral vision could I see them. Looked straight on, and they weren't there. What do you want? I bet my thoughts at them. Why do you have my mother? Suddenly, the heavy cord went taut. The kite pitched wildly from side to side. Our feet scrabbled on loose scree, and the man at the front of the line lost his footing and went down. Without thinking, I leapt forward and took his place. The wind checked for an instant, giving the kite a bit of slack, and I wrapped the cord around my wrist for an anchor. Is this wise, came a thought, echoed by a volley of warning caws from Oberon. And with that, the wind surged. I was born into the air, into the singing wind. Who was playing piano up here on Signal Hill? It was my mother's favorite piece, by the man whose lover, she told me, had been unafraid to dress in men's clothing. A funeral march. Why was my mother so enamored of death? 
A great flashing brightness flared around the edges of my vision, stretching from ground to sky with jagged flaring edges bright as the sun. It was as if flames of every color had stabbed down from heaven and into my eyes. Inside the shining, they danced and yammered. The sparkling crenellation shook and shimmered like a shower of falling stars. They fell into blackness, a great nothing straight ahead of me, a black, blank tunnel. Floating in the abyss, I began to make out a lighter shape, a pale blue shadow. I couldn't see her face, but I knew her. It was my mother. She sat in the abyss, rocking her body back and forth. They laughed. What have you done with her? The cord around my wrist tightened until I thought my hand would pinch off. I couldn't tell how high off the ground I was. I couldn't see, nor could I hear, for there was a great roaring in my ears. I could be over the sea or mere inches from the ground. The thin and threading sound as of a baby crying turned the marrow of my bones to ice. Then a great shrieking crowd cried out, falling from the kite, jagged stars in the chasm. Through the glitter and mayhem tore of the big black feathered figure. Ka ka ka! The sparkling at the periphery of my vision gave one last flare like fireworks dispersing outward. The black chasm sucked away like water going down a drain, and with it, the pale blue ghostly image of my mother. No, I cried. The laughter faded into mere wind. I was suspended up in the air, wrist entangled, arm in agony. Above me, the kite wrenched and yawed. I was a rag doll in the jaws of a black dog, helplessly jerking up and down. The kite, with me tangled in its cord, was being pulled toward the cliff edge by the inexorable winds. Below me, the men shouted and heaved, trying to get the kite back to earth. Dig in your scrapers, the tall man cried, but it was futile. We were all as one, being pulled toward the edge. They were hanging onto the kite to save me. Terror surged through me. I had to let go, lest everyone die for my sake. But I was trapped. I yelled into the wind, let me go. The men below hung on still, getting dragged toward the cliff. Gah, cut it, cut the cord, Oberon circled my head. Swinging from my arm, the world whirling, I shut my eyes tight, feeling in my pocket. There it was, the pocket knife my father had given me. I managed to get it out. How would I open it? I clenched my front teeth over the exposed spine, and the blade popped open, wrenching my teeth. My mouth tasted of metal and blood. The cliff edge was close, so close now. I cut the cord. With a spring, the fibers unraveled under my blade and spun away. I fell like a stone. 